Okay, if you got your Bibles, uh, bust them out. We're in the book of Revelation. Uh, we're going through the entire book, uh, chapter by chapter, uh, verse by verse. As you're going to Revelation 2, we'll be looking at verse 18 today and finishing the second chapter of Revelation. So, man, we are just flying through this book now, aren't we? Um, now, I will say a big thanks to Pastor Greg for teaching uh, and expounding on Revelation chapter 2 and the letter to uh, the church in Ephesus. And so Pastor Greg crushed it. I, I saw a little bit of it. We were in Cambodia. We're going to give you a report on that at our Mission Sunday coming up in April. we got videos and photos and a drama for you. Just kidding. We don't have a drama. Um, I might have a bit of a mime. I don't know. I'm still praying about it. But uh, we were in Cambodia. I, I, I turned it on just a little bit. Greg, Greg was just doing such a great job. Um, so, Pastor Greg, thank you for, for that. Um, and then, also while I was gone, uh, Pastor Masood uh, absolutely crushed the text of verse 8, uh, yep, through 11, and the letter to Smyrna and the persecuted church. Uh, Pastor Masood, so much love and honor uh, in my heart towards you. Uh, we, we are so uh, honored to have you and Pastor Sarah, your incredible family, a part of Eden. We are better because of you guys. I also uh, wanted to give a big thank you to Pastor Brad, who absolutely crushed uh, last week and the letter to the church uh, in Pergamum, which I thought was just, uh, you had me laughing, you know, almost had me crying, but I fast forward to that. I don't like to cry. Um, no, Pergamum means uh, to be married. Uh, yeah, marriage. And Pastor Brad and Maria, I have such a heart uh, and calling to the family uh, to see restored identity and to see healthy families and, and marriages. In fact, uh, Pastor Brad is about to unveil uh, their big um, Eden marriage uh, curriculum uh, for people preparing for marriage and also people that want to have stronger marriages. So we can't wait to, I haven't even seen that yet. He's been working on that for a few months. But how, how amazing is it, you know, that Pastor Brad brought the message uh, on Pergamum, which means uh, marriage, and also just so beautifully represented uh, the Father heart of God and a, and a heart of mercy. And so thank you, Pastor Brad, for absolutely crushing that. Uh, we love you. We love Maria. We celebrate the birth of your beautiful grand girl, your grandbaby. And uh, I hear you guys are going to, uh, to see her here real soon. And so uh, uh, that'll be good. Get, get out of get out of here for a bit. And, uh, Brad works so stupid hard around here. And uh, we, sure, we sure love him. And we give thanks to the Lord uh, for Pastor Brad and for Pastor Maria. So, okay, enough about them. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is a letter uh, from Jesus to the seven churches in Revelation that we have been uh, studying it's interesting, when the book of Revelation begins, uh, it's a Sunday, it's the day of resurrection, and John is caught up into a, into a vision. And um, John hears the voice, okay, the voice of the Lord. The voice comes from behind him. And it's interesting, John uh, says, and I turned uh, to see the voice, which is fascinating, because you don't typically see uh, a voice. Okay, and he turned to see the voice, and he's going to see Jesus. The book of Revelation exists to reveal Christ the King, Jesus the Christ. The book of Revelation does not exist to reveal the Antichrist. This book exists to promote and catalyze courage in the hearts of the saints. It does not exist to produce fear in the heart of the church. Okay? All right. So uh, John turns uh, to see the voice. And when he turns, he thinks he's going to see the face of Jesus. This, this is absolutely fascinating. Okay, when he turns, he sees seven candlesticks. Okay, the seven candlesticks, uh, the, 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 the lampstands, okay, these are the seven churches. Seven literal churches uh, in uh, 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 Asia Minor, which is now Turkey, okay, Seven means complete or whole. Okay, so yes, this is seven letters to seven literal churches, but seven speaks of the church as a whole. Okay, and so uh, we see a letter written to the whole church, right? And so he sees the seven uh, uh, lampstands, the seven churches, which is, which is fascinating. 
He, he hears the voice. He turns to see the voice. He thinks he's going to see Jesus, but he sees the church. All right. Why is that a big deal? Okay. Before Christ reveals his face, he first reveals his body. The church is the body of Christ. All right. Now, if this earth, if, this, if cities and nations are going to have an encounter, okay, a revelation of Jesus, how's that going to happen? They are first going to see the body before they see the head. Okay? What does that mean? That means that your neighbor is going to see you before it sees the face of Christ. Amen. What does this mean? It means that a move of the Spirit on the earth is always going to take place through the body. Okay? God moves on the earth through his body. The church is the primary agency by which God reveals himself. This is the book of Revelation. And the first revelation that John is going to have is the body of Christ, the church. We need to have a high view of the church. You say, yeah, but there's sin in the church. So it can't really be the body of Christ. Yes, there, are, there, there was sin in the church. There was sin in these churches. We're going to read about that today. But John is going to look. He's going to see seven churches. And guess what? In the midst of the imperfect church is Jesus and he's not sitting. He's standing. Most people, when they think about the, the book of Revelation, um, how many of you have ever studied the book of Revelation? Okay, awesome. Um, most people, when they think about the book of Revelation, they sum it up as um, Christ the King, throne room. That's usually where most people go. Um, the revelation of Christ is not firstly Christ the King. It's not, no. Why? Because kings sit in throne rooms. The first encounter, when John is caught up, he sees the church. And in the midst of the church is Jesus, and he's not sitting. He's standing. Why? Well, the only way we can know why is we have to look at what he's wearing. Okay? Uh, if you want to know what somebody does, look at what, they, what the, look at what they're wearing. Okay? Who are you wearing today? All right. Okay, stay focused. <laughs> Jesus is wearing a white robe, okay, and a golden girdle. What's that? He's dressed as a priest. He's dressed as a high priest. And in the temple, there was no provision for seats. Why? Because priests don't sit. Priests stand and serve. It is the role of a priest to always be serving, to always be preparing something, always doing something. It's mom on Thanksgiving. <laughs> Kings sit in thrones and watch the Macy's Day Parade. Priest, burn the grave. Okay, all right. Here's Jesus, Jesus as priest in the midst of the seven churches. What's he doing? He's not saying he's serving his bride. He's serving. Isn't this fascinating? So yes, we're going to get a revelation of Christ the King. Absolutely. It's going to be amazing. We're going to get a revelation of the throne room. It's going to be awesome. Okay. But we don't get a revelation of kingship until we first get a revelation of of priesthood. And this has huge implications on the church because he is, he is our head and we are his body. So we participate with him in his priestly nature. We also participate with him in his kingly nature. And by the way, if you're a businessman, that doesn't mean that you're a, that you're a king, okay? And that all the pastors in town have to listen to you because you're the money guy. You're the, you're the kingship. No, no, no. The whole body with a revelation of Christ. You and I, we are to walk in both the priestly and the kingly anointing. Okay? So if you are a businessman, God bless you, but you need to be just as much a priest and just as much an in. This is what I love about the businessmen in Eden. Um, I know a lot of them, okay? And they are just as much priests as they are kings. They, they spend just as much time in their day ministering to the Lord and seeking the Lord in their prayer closet as they are ruling from their place of, of business. I love the businessmen of, of Eden. They are walking in revelation and, and blessing, okay? You are to be a priest, um, uh, ministering to the Lord. 
Lord, ministering to his people, okay? Priests don't say things like, ah, I don't go to church anymore uh, there because they just weren't feeding me. I wasn't being fed. That's not the way that priests talk. Why? Priests do the feeding. Priests know the word. They teach the word. And every member of Eden is a priest. And every member of Eden is called to be a king. Hallelujah. You are an intercessor. You are a prayer warrior. You're a woman of authority. You are a man of authority. And don't worry. Say, I can't do any of this. <laughs> don't worry. Either can I. There's grace. There's grace to do what we could never do. And, and of our, isn't this fascinating? It's the revelation of that if you're, you're going to see Jesus, you first have to see his body. You have to see his bride. We have to be kind to his bride. We have to be kind to his, his imperfect um, to his imperfect church and to love, to love his church, to love, love your body. The number one sin in the American church is body shaming. Yeah, and anytime we do that, we're body shaming somebody's wife. Yeah, all right. Okay, so uh, today we're going to be looking at the church of Thyatira. We, I, I do have a, um, a map here of the, uh, the seven churches. I'll have, uh, I'll have our team uh, put it up here. Um, just off of the coast of Ephesus um, is uh, Patmos where uh, John the Beloved is, is exiled, okay? So he's a prisoner on Patmos where he gets the revelation. He would pen this as one letter, okay? And this one letter would then be hand-delivered from a messenger from Patmos to Ephesus, okay? It is in Ephesus. They would receive the letter. They would rejoice. They just got a letter from John, yes, but even more impressively, they just got a letter from Jesus, okay? Big, big, big deal, okay? Okay? The messenger would then go from Ephesus to Smyrna, okay, from Smyrna up to Pergamos or Pergamum, okay. The Pergamum, as Pastor Brad was unpacking last week, that's like the Washington, D.C. of Asia Minor, okay. This is where there are lobbyists. This is where there's legislation, okay. There's a tremendous a political influence here, okay. And then the letter would go from Pergamum down to Thyatira. Now, Thyatira was established by Alexander the Great to be like a border city, to be like a protective city, to be a wall of defense, to protect Pergamum, okay? But here's what happened. Thyatira is not this large, huge uh, uh, hub in the same way that Ephesus was or Pergamum, and yet, man, the, 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 the resources there, okay, They're this very fine red clay that you couldn't find anywhere else, uh, they also had the best water, okay, with the best minerals, and they were able to produce dyes and textiles and fabrics. In fact, it was from Thyatira. Do you remember the story of when Jesus leads the millionaire, uh, fashionaire, uh, Lydia, okay? Uh, she is this, she is this, she's like, a, she's like a New York fashion designer, okay? Uh, very influential, Lydia. And she was from Thyatira, okay? She was an expert in in, in dyes, in, in purple dyes, and textiles, and, and, and fabrics. And, uh, and Paul leads her to the Lord, and she becomes an incredible evangelist and leader uh, in uh, the church from Thyatira, okay? So uh, this letter uh, comes to this place, and this is a place where the arts are, uh, uh, this is a very artistic uh, a community. You've got a lot of people that are working with silver, case okay, silversmiths. You have a lot of people working with bronze, um, this is also a place of, of, of great pagan influence. It's very interesting. Usually, wherever you see the kind of arts that influence a society, you also see whether it's celebrated or it's more under the soil. And in our culture, in American culture, there hasn't been an overt celebration of paganism until just this last year. But in the ancient world, okay, paganism was something that was greatly, greatly uh, celebrated. In fact, there was such an integration of spirituality into the arts and into business that in order to have a job in Thyatira, you'd have to work for, you'd have to be a part of a guild, okay? So you'd have these various guilds, okay? And these guilds, okay, would be... Um, uh, fashioned around your place of industry or what you do. So uh, you would have these, these people that would gather according to their industry, but it was also almost more like various pagan denominations. 
okay? There were no secular guilds, which meant that if you became a Christian, okay, and imagine you have to go to your, your guild meeting, okay, this is a place of sacrifice. This is a place of, of great uh, uh, pagan integration, uh, integrating uh, demonic uh, ideas uh, into the arts, opening up even portals and counterfeit gateways in this place that, that, that your spirituality, that your pagan spirituality could promote blessing and breakthrough in your place of industry, okay? This happens in our country to this day. In fact, many, uh, uh, many creatives, even in the Silicon Valley, talk about when they're coming up with various concepts for features and benefits of products, or whether it's graphic design, or even the name of a company. It's very common for these people to go out uh, into the desert and to do hallucinogenics, okay, to do DMT, uh, various things to open up a, a, a gateway, if you will, where they get um, names for their company, where they get ideas for features for these different kinds of things, okay. You go into the whole world. We just got back from Cambodia, and uh, uh, in Cambodia, you go to a hotel, and there's going to be a little spirit house outside of the the business, okay? And they, 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 they have great detail with these spirit houses. If you stay at a hotel, you go down to the lobby of the hotel, and there's going to be a, a shrine, but it always looks like a home, a home for the, the spirits. And people bring their offerings, and they'll have, they'll have rice there and, and incense. I think one place even had a little shot of whiskey. Apparently, those spirits had a drinking problem, and, you know, and they'd, you know, they, they would even have candy for the spirits. You have these spirit houses, okay? Um, some were quite small. They'd have them elevated if they're outside of the business, okay? But, and then there were some that were like, you know, l little miniature Bill Gates mansions for these, you know, s spirits, which says something about these spirits. You know, they're just little pixie things, you know. You're like, how powerful can these things be to enjoy that living room in there? But it's this idea, man, if we appease the spirits, they're going to bless our, 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 our business. And if we do this right, they will also scare off and ward off the, the bad servants the bad spirits. And you see this all throughout um, the East. And then you also see, it's not as in your face. You don't see spirit houses necessarily um, in the Silicon Valley or in Redmond, uh, uh, Medina. You don't, see, you don't see that as much. And yet, okay, if you're outside of Christ, there is a tremendous integration of spirituality and commerce in this place where it's not too compartmentalized. Okay, if you are in Christ, you should not compartmentalize your faith from your place of business. Why? You have a God that actually wants to bless you, okay? You don't have to put out some sort of trinkets to scare off, okay, the bad spirits. Why? The blood of Jesus is over the doorpost of your house. The angel of death has to pass over your house because of the blood of Jesus that is spoken for you and your family. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans not to harm you, but plans to prosper you. Plans to give you a future and a hope. You say, well, that sounds like the prosperity gospel. No, it's just the Bible. Read the Bible, okay? And if you want to go through your whole Bible and cut out everywhere it says that God wants to be kind to you, if you want to go through your whole Bible and take a sharpie to every spot where it says that God wants to bless you because it doesn't line up with John MacArthur, then you go at it. But as for me, I'm going to leave the word blessed all throughout my Bible. I'm going to leave the word prosperous all throughout my Bible. And I don't want to play the game of compartmentalizing, saying, oh, this is cr Christianity fits on my Sunday. And then on Monday, I'm just going to do my own little business thing, work real hard and hope, hope, hope my, my toil produces some results. No. Invite God into your business. Invite God into your marriage. Invite God into your parenting. Invite God into your sin. You're about to do something real stupid. Invite Jesus into it. You're about to have an affair. Invite, say, Jesus, you come here right here, right now. You tell me what you think about this. Invite Jesus into everything and watch what he says. Watch what he does. I mean, we, we think we're sneaky sometimes, thinking that just because we didn't invite him, that he's not there. We think that just because we don't honor him on Monday, that somehow he's not there. All right. So we see this in Thyatira, this, this huge merging of paganism and the culture, and Christians are losing their jobs. Okay. Uh, have we read the text? I was just having so much fun telling you about it. Let's read it. You look bored. Jump up to your feet. We're going to read the Word of God this morning. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, 
the words of the Son of God. This is a big deal. Why is it a big deal? Because in Thyatira, they worshiped Apollos, who is referred to as the Son of God. This is Jesus saying, I am the one and true Son of God. He says, who has eyes like flames of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze? Who is he talking to? The guys that work with bronze in Thyatira. This is what Jesus says. I know who you are. I know what you do. I know you better than you know yourself. Hey, it's me, son of God. Listen up. He says, I know your works. Look at this, your love. Remember in Ephesus? He says, you got everything going on. You're like the perfect Christians. You got the works, you got discernment, but you forgot your first love. The very first thing that Jesus says to Thyatira is, I know your love. I know your love for me, your faith, your servant, your service, and your patient endurance, that your latter works exceed the first, but I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess, and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her into a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works. I will strike her children dead, and all the, children, and all the churches will know I am he, who searches the mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden, only hold fast that what you have, uh, hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers, the one who keeps my works, until the end, to him I will give authority over nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as myself have received authority from my Father, I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We say, speak to us, Holy Spirit. Your servants are here listening and waiting on you. Amen. We know that you have correction for the church, for our generation. Lord, allow us the grace and the humility to hear what you have to say. Father, I pray that this morning we wouldn't finger point at other denominations who have gone woke and most likely broke. <laughs> But Lord, uh, we would say, Lord, I know your spirit is speaking to my heart. I pray that I would leave here transformed by the renewing of my mind. Yes. Father, I thank you. It is impossible to humbly study your word without being changed by it. And Father, we ask that we would be a church where Jesus can be seen for who he really is, not for what we're trying to project onto him. Father, I thank you for each and every person that's here today, each and every family that's represented today. And I pray that every person that leaves here would leave with hope, with courage, with a knowing that Jesus is God, that Jesus is Lord, and that Jesus is Savior. That Jesus is willing to step into the chaos and drama of, of, of our own situations and storylines to redeem it, to change it for his glory. Jesus, we love you. We love your word. We love your church. And we love this earth, this kingdom that you've given to us as our inheritance. Be glorified today. In Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Um, as you're being seated, I do see uh, people that I don't recognize today. So, hello. I've been here 15 years. No, no. Glad you could finally show up. Um, just kidding. Hey, listen, uh, after the service, uh, I'm just going to hit on a couple points out of this, okay? And then we're going to wrap up in prayer, and I'm going to have my team come. Um, but on the way out, I'd love to meet you. I'd love to give you a high five. So on the way out of the service today, come see me in the hallway. Uh, I'll give you a copy of my book, okay? Uh, sign it for you. Answer any questions that you have. Uh, that's our gift to you. Is that good? Okay, awesome. All right. When we look at uh, Thyatira, okay, 
uh, this prosperous town, okay, uh, this, this town where Christians are sacrificing greatly. We see that the Lord commends them on their love, on their service, okay, on their faithfulness. And he says, I have this one thing against you. You are tolerating this false prophetess, um, and he calls her Jezebel, okay? Was her name actually Jezebel? No, okay. And if you're a new Christian, uh, Jezebel is just one of those names that you shouldn't name your children or your cat. <laughs> okay? Uh, Jezebel, Jezebel was, was an evil, evil woman from the Old Testament. Uh, she was the, uh, the wife of King Ahab. Okay? And he had authority. Uh, he had authority as king uh, in Israel. Okay? But we actually see that, uh, that, that, that behind the throne, was a puppet master, uh, that the person that we saw as the decision maker, as the ruler, Ahab, was actually just a puppet, and that the real person in power couldn't necessarily be, be I rebuke that, look at, there she is, all right, I'm not going to tolerate her, all right. The real person with the power was the person behind the scenes. Sound familiar? Okay. Uh, so many times we see somebody in power, we think they're the problem. Oftentimes, the person in power isn't the problem. Oftentimes, the people with the real power don't want to be in the spotlight. All right? Now, we see uh, 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 Jezebel in the Old Testament had it out to rid the earth of all of God's prophets. She killed all of the prophets of Yahweh except for one prophet. There was only one remaining, and that was Elijah. Okay, Elijah had a burning, jealous, fiery love obsession for Yahweh. And because he had this burning, firing love obsession for Yahweh, he wanted to represent Yahweh truthfully and without compromise. This meant not only was he the last true prophet, okay, he was the undefiled uncompromised voice of the Lord on the earth. He represents prophetic purity on the earth, okay? Yeah, but his obsession was not prophetic purity. His obsession was Yahweh. The, that his love, his jealous, fiery love for God is what produced integrity, okay? Listen, we don't obsess over prophetic purity, nor do we use our time attempting to stone false prophets. Just say amen. amen. Any time that you spend trying to expose false prophets is time that you are robbing the world of the good news of Jesus Christ. Okay, um, Elijah did not spend his time, okay, trying to expose Jezebel. Uh, his time was spent ob obsessing over the character and nature of Yahweh. Love God, okay? You love God. Love who he is, okay? And the fruit of your jealous, fiery love for God will be integrity and purity in your own ministry. Amen? All right. So Jezebel, okay, was out to, to rid the voice of the Lord uh, on the earth. Now, in this particular text, and she's a seductress, and she's, she got her place through flattery, and there's that whole, there's that whole dynamic in the culture today. Uh, in, the, in the church, it happens all the time. People use their, their gifts and their, their flattery. Uh, they don't want the position they want the power behind the position. It happens in churches all the time. Uh, they're, they're, they're not coming in to promote themselves. They're coming in to shut that church down. Uh, the, every Jezebel is on a prophetic assignment to subvert a move of God and to shut churches down. Okay? And, it, and it's usually, it looks like, through the, through the gift of the prophetic. Okay? In this context... You are tolerating this false prophet, Jezebel, in your church. So it looks like the prophetic. It looks like flattery. It's seductive, okay? It sounds deep. It sounds like, wow, where are they getting this information? Wow, they must be really connected to God because I've never heard this taught before. Wow, this is, this is really, this is some inside stuff. But meanwhile, their heart is to bring compromise and to shut down the move of God because Jezebel hates Jesus. Jezebel hates Yahweh. Jezebel hates God. 
okay? Now, the church here is tolerating um, this, uh, this woman, okay, this, this false prophetess. And she's got disciples, okay? She's got uh, children, okay? And God says, I've given her time to repent. But just so you know, this is my church. This isn't your church, Thyatira. This is my church, okay? And I will not let her destroy my church. This is what Jesus is saying. I've given her time to repent, and if she doesn't repent, I'll kill her because I would rather kill her and save my whole church. Do you see this? I've given her time to repent, and not only will I kill her, I'll kill her disciples. And I'll tell you what I'll do it. I'm going to do it in the very place where sin spread, in the bed. In the place meant for covenantal marital intimacy is that place where they have defiled this place, and I will use the bed to bring justice. This is, so, this, is, this, is such a big, this is such a big deal. And so we see here uh, in, uh, in, in, in Thyatira um, uh, this, this assimilation, this acceptance of a spirituality okay, that was not based in Christ, that was not based in Jesus. You see where you get that from? It says, in, for anyone who subscribes to the, 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 this teaching that he calls the, deep, the deeper things of Satan, that's what he calls it, okay? And he goes, however, for those who do not subscribe to this teaching of the deeper things of Satan, this, this secret knowledge, okay? This, the, or we're going to do some th- teaching on the secret things today, the, the, the hidden things, okay? The things not taught in the word of God. Now, there was a gullibility in the church of Thyatira, and this gullibility exists in the supernatural charismatic church today. It sure does. And the reason why is because the supernatural is pretty new to the church today. For generations, the only form of supernatural activity was tongues. But in the last 20 years, there is the celebration and acceptance of supernatural activity that you wouldn't have heard talked about 30 or 40 years ago. The, 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 education and equipping on on angels and dreams and all the stuff that I write about in my new book. Yay, okay. The thought is this. If you're in Christ, anything supernatural is kosher. That, that's the idea. If you're in Christ, you can engage with anything that's supernatural and it will be clean because Jesus is your filter. Listen, Jesus is not your filter and Christianity is not a cigarette. Okay? You cannot bring pollution into your body thinking that your profession of Jesus as Savior is going to protect you from deception. If it's not Christ-centric, Christocentric, if it's not Jesus-centered, okay, you do not need to bring it into your body. And, uh, and, and we could go into some things. I don't want to because we're streaming. I'll talk about some things tonight, things that I'm very uh, concerned about. Um, Thyatira was a radically pagan culture, okay, steeped in, uh, in the kind of ancient knowledge that most likely we're talking about the kind of knowledge and things, okay, that are true. Probably even stuff that was taught um, by the Nephilim and secret knowledge that was given to humanity through the sons of God. This kind of, this kind of thing. We're talking about the kind of stuff um, that the Masons begin to celebrate. It is the kind of stuff where, you know, maybe the Illuminati, you know, the kind of stuff, you know, th- that structured the maps by which Washington, D.C. was formed and, and framed. We're talking about stuff that is true and yet it ain't for you. And that, that's going to mess with you. I hear these bitter, bitter people on YouTube saying, I didn't learn this in my church. And so my church was trying to keep me from knowledge. There were two trees in the garden, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They were instructed to eat of the tree of life. And uh, you can disagree with me on this, on this point. I think you've got to make a decision. Is Jesus going to be your Lord or is knowledge going to be your Lord? Because there is this place where, um, where you begin to receive things that are true, and yet they aren't for you. Pagan knowledge, okay? These kinds of things. This is what's going on in Thyatira, okay? And it began to result in adultery, 
Okay? And in sexual immorality, why? Because spiritual compromise will always lead to sexual compromise. Why? Because sexual compromise is spiritual. All right. We like to think in America, I sleep with who I want. I'm a free woman. I'm a free man, you know. Uh, I'm a single ladies. Okay. All right. I do it around. Okay. All right. Yeah, the problem with that is that uh, your sexuality is spiritual. Your, that, that sex was created by God for the worship uh, of Yahweh and that it exists for union. Okay. The devil wants to be in union with you. He wants you as his possession. Why? Because he wants the earth as his possession. Okay? The, the battle is for the earth. The battle is for the sons of God. Uh, this is an ancient battle. And that means it has everything to do with worship, but it has little to do with songs. <laughs> it has everything to do with your union. Your, your, your legal union is legal agreement. Legal participation. And this is what the church has find, found herself in this place of being engaged with something that is subversive and demonic. And this is what he says. He says, I have this against you. You tolerate this prophet. Um, the word tolerate there is, is interesting. Um, if you read it in the Greek, this is how it actually reads. It says, you uh, sufferest Jezebel. So we're going to get the idea of suffer. But it's not just suffering. You think, you know, if I'm suffering and it's not my fault, that means what? It means I'm a victim, right? If you ever suffer something, you did nothing wrong, you're a victim of that. When you tolerate something, you're not a victim. Why? Because it's suffering where you have the ability to do something about it, but you choose not to. You have the ability to stop the suffering, but for whatever reason, you're choosing not to stop the suffering. Here's the church, Thyatira. She is suffering underneath the weight of spiritual sexual compromise. And, and we all know this place. If, if, you're, if you're a believer in Christ, okay, and there's any sort of compromise, okay, you believe in Jesus, you're compromising because of your flesh, because of your desire. Your spirit knows what it's like to grieve in that place. When you are being tempted and you're saying yes to temptation, Okay? Um, your spirit never rejoices. There is this place of tremendous suffering, and yet you have the ability to get set free. All you have to do is turn away from that behavior. This is called repentance. You turn away from this sin. You turn to Christ. You ask him for forgiveness, and he can break the power of that suffering within your life. Listen, every person here, you have the ability and the authority to end the suffering when you're tolerating something that is demonic. And, 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 and yet, there are many churches in America that are tolerating the spirit and the and operational through flesh and blood that are tolerating Jezebels. And these churches are, are getting smaller and smaller. You know, these, these uh, 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 no sort of moral record. And it's because of spiritual, theological compromise. And it always leads to sexual, com you, I don't know if, I, I'm kind of into like cult documentaries, okay? It's kind of a, you know, I like to watch them. I like to watch these cult documentaries and, 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 and all this stuff. And I don't know. I don't know. It's, they're interesting. And they always start off so noble. You know, a, a good cult, okay, <laughs> always starts off like, wow, this is like, this is like the best cult ever, right? You know, we're losing weight for Jesus. You see that one? You know, you know it was like a weight loss church. That was crazy. Um, you know, these, these cults always start off so noble, you know. We harness the energy of trees, and then we step into unprecedented financial prosperity. Like, there could, how, how could there be anything wrong with harnessing energy that God created within trees and turning that into finance? You know, they always start off that way, but then they always end with, you know, the one bald guy in the robe sleeping with everybody. Every cult always ends the same way. The leader of the cult sleeps with everybody. Everyone, everybody, you know, and, and everybody's good with it. You got husbands, oh, well, he's, you know, he said he's got those, the, 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 yeah, I don't know. They always got something, you know. Yeah, 
spiritual compromise always leads to sexual compromise because sexual compromise opens up a gateway. It opens up a portal and it gives the enemy legal access. And if you've given the enemy legal access, you know, uh, attachments of soul, soul ties, partners, organizations, churches, cults, we could go on and on and on. This stuff's easy to deal with because the word of God says, but for him who overcomes. Uh, the, the text ends with, to him who overcomes, which means to him who conquers. To him who, it's actually the, the Greek word for dominate. You see, uh, the Lord doesn't want you to be harassed by sexual sin any longer. The Lord doesn't want you to be um, wooed by flattering nonsense spirituality that appears to be a great add-on to your faith. Okay? We don't need more widgets and add-ons to our faith. We need to strip ourselves of add-ons and widgets and get back to the fundamentals of Christianity. Which, by the way, you, you're, you, you can do the, um, you know, the third grade test on your theology. You know, if you're a third grader or a fourth grader, if they don't understand what you're talking about, most likely you've been lured away from the true gospel of Jesus Christ. If you can't explain it to your, to your child, if a child doesn't get it, most likely Jesus doesn't get it. Jesus is like, you don't need that. You just need me. I like what Owen said. This is what we do. We take people out and we just say, just find someone, any, any person, just find somebody and just do this. Jesus loves you. And then see what happens. That's what we do. We just take people out, just find someone, just say, Jesus loves you. How could that work? How could something like that work? Well, you mentioned the most powerful name in all of human history, the greatest intercessor who is seated at the right hand of the Father in his glorified body that has been interceding since the beginning of time for this person who's minding their own business, walking out of Walmart. Jesus has been praying, 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 waiting for a saint who would obey. And all of a sudden, here comes Owen and his homies, and they say, just wanted to let you know Jesus loves you and they break down crying or they get healed and they invite Jesus to come. You know, uh, all you need is him. And no matter what you've done, no matter what sin, no matter what, you know, whatever generational gateways or portals, I got to tell you a quick story. Um, uh, I, I got this lady in our, our portals university, uh, she's Presbyterian, and um, her and her husband moved into a house that was owned by the Freemasons, and, uh, which isn't a good idea. Unless you get a good deal on it. All right. <laughs> they did their rituals. They did their rituals and rites in this house. And generations owned by the Freemason uh, organization. So they moved into this house, and the house was, was, yep, you guessed it, haunted. Haunted is as haunted does. <laughs> Presbyterians, right? No grid for the supernatural. It was so scary at night. And it, it, it's all the typical stuff with the haunted house, okay? All the, all the stuff. So scary at night, their 13-year-old boy wouldn't sleep in his room. Their 13-year-old boy would sleep at the foot of, foot of their bed. And she didn't know what to do. So, so she did what the Bible says to do. She YouTubed it. <laughs> what, to do about a, what to do about a haunted house. And guess who popped up? Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> I came up on her YouTube, Sid Roth and I, and we're talking about portals. Isn't that awesome? So anyways, she, uh, she got connected with us and went through her. Anyways, she went through her house. And guess what? She didn't call the priest. She stepped into her priesthood. Isn't this awesome? She stepped into her priesthood. She went through the whole house, okay? Prayed through the house. Kicked all those unclean spirits out of the house. And guess what? It ain't haunted no more. Yeah. And not only that, but now she knows who she is in Jesus. And guess what? She don't go to the Presbyterian church no more. She's, in a, she's in, a, a, in a new church where they believe in the Holy Spirit. And, uh, sorry, I didn't mean that as a dig. I love my Presbyterian brothers and sisters. I'm just saying, there's more, okay? And uh, uh, her husband still goes to the Presbyterian church. But um, isn't that awesome? That God just uh, absolutely, what am I saying? I'm saying that, that he who the Son sets free is free indeed. And there's not, there's not, a, there's not one reason why you should remain in bondage. There's not one reason why you should be flirting with spirituality that is not centered in Christ. 
okay? And there is not one reason why you should be sexually engaging with anything. That is not your covenant spouse. And this is the message to the church of Thyatira. Yes, this is the message to the church in Seattle. I had a family here at our first service. Awesome family. We had a lot of fun. They all lined up. They all got free books, okay? It was great. Really great guys. And said, well, why, what, what brought you here? They said, well, our last church, we were faithful members for a long, long time, um, decided to put in transgender bathrooms. And he said, well, that was the final straw for us. Uh, I would say to the church of Seattle, I write, this one thing I have against you. You have tolerated a demonic spirit that has come to bring sexual compromise, that comes to say that you can't fight for the virtues of the Bible without disgracing and, and treating people like dirt. All that is nonsense. God loved the world. God loves every human being that he wants them healed, healthy, whole. Uh, that he wants every person to be able to receive love and to be able to give love away. And if you're here in this place and you wrestle with, with the gender attraction thing, you're a guy, you're attracted to guys, you're a girl, you're attracted to girls, praise God. Darren, why would you say praise God? Because God loves you. He has a plan for your life. He wants to heal you. He wants to wash you away of all shame. And he wants to restore you uh, to a place that you've never been before. Better than the womb. It's called being born again. And not only that. Not only does he want to bring beauty out of the ashes, not only want, do, does he want to, um, uh, he actually can redeem abuse and, and sexual abuse and, and he can re redeem even the crazy things that, that, that we've done. What does that mean to redeem it? He can make it as though it, it, that it never happened. It, it's still there. You still remember it, but it doesn't, it doesn't cripple you like it used to. In fact, now it gives you a sense of conviction. And it gives you a sense of like, wow, if, I, if all this has happened in my life, and yet God loves me and, and, and can actually use me in this. What could God do for my friend? What could God do for my spouse? What could God do for my, for my coworker? What if I didn't have to tell people they were in sin because I actually believe in the power of the Holy Spirit to convict people of sin? What if my job was just to say, hey, look, despite what, what you've heard, despite how you feel, God loves you. God loves you. And what if the power of God, what if the acceptance of Christ, what if the Holy Spirit, what if the Holy Spirit was faithful to do what he said he would do in his word? That's pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome. So we don't need to, um, we don't need to be like throwing rocks at adulterers and, and exposing false prophets and getting all hopped up on stuff that's going to distract us from the Great Commission. You know, Jesus did not leave us on the earth so that we could go, go around um, shooting people on Facebook. He left us on the earth so that we would make disciples of cities and nations and bring forth the, the good news. And if we're not able to good news, we've got to, get, we've got to get healed so that we're able to fulfill our purpose. Our purpose, yet our purpose is to good news everything. Good news it, good news it, good news it, until it begins to terraform back into Eden. <laughs> good news it, good news it, good news it until we begin to transform into the image and likeness of Jesus. Hallelujah. We'll get into some stuff. We got into some stuff today. I mean, this wasn't exactly the seeker sensitive service. This is what's going on, man. You know, we could just keep it real like, here's three ways to lose weight, right? Here's five ways to have a better marriage, you know? We might as well just call a duck a duck and talk about some stuff that's actually going on to see that there's like a, a very real fight, a very real battle. Yeah, and it's just not a good time to play church. Church, by the way, church is just a stupid hobby anyway. Yeah, it's probably time to enlist into an army. Probably time to get into a home group. Yeah, probably a good time to, to have a band of brothers around you. It's probably a good time to ask people you can actually call to ask for prayer. Hey, I'm in some stuff. Let's get a little hairy. Okay, we're going to need that. We're going to be, we're already in, in some stuff. I've already had to ask for prayer recently. You know, we haven't seen any, we haven't seen anything yet. Man, it's a good time to put down some roots. It's a good time to get your hope restored. Okay, okay. 
Hallelujah. I was talking to one guy this last week, and he was talking to us about, our, about the new book that we got coming out. And I saw, you know that um, uh, the average Christian leads, I think it's like one point, it's, it's a funny stat. It's like 1.78 people to the Lord their entire Christian career. So we could sit, round it up to two. The average Christian leads two people to, their Lord, to the Lord in their entire life. That's in America. Probably not true of China. Yeah. They probably wouldn't let you in the church in China if that was your, if that was your record. I said, um, you realize we're going to do that this afternoon. Ended the interview, got the guys in the car and went, went out and hit the streets. What'd you do, Pastor? Just told people Jesus loves you. Hallelujah. It's a good time to be alive if you know him. Okay, last thing, off topic. Hope this is okay. Uh, I need to get you out of here because, um, well, McDonald's will be open, I promise. But, all right. Solar eclipse. Okay. You guys following that? Okay, solar eclipse. If any of that stuff, okay, is, uh, is making you afraid at all, okay, if you're at Walmart but it's not telling people about Jesus, it's stocking up on Top Ramen, you know, some of you know what I'm talking about. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just ignore me, okay? I'm going to wrap up this service real quick. Is there any fear or any, any stuff about earthquakes, National Guard or any of that stuff, uh, just don't watch it. Just stop watching it. And go out with Owen this week and tell people about, uh, here's what we're going to be doing different this week because of the, are you ready? This is what we're going to do different this week because of the solar eclipse, which is going to usher forth the Antichrist and the rapture and then the destruction of America as we know it. Okay, this is, this is what we're going to do differently as a church. On Tuesday night, we'll be here casting out devils, healing the sick, okay, um, seeing people come to know Jesus. On Thursday night, we'll have teams out in the street leading people to Jesus, casting out demons, okay? We're going to be doing this stuff. Uh, uh, we're we're going to have prayer going on every day. You know, here's what's going to be different this week. Nothing. Why? 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 Because we believe that prophecy comes from the heart of God, not an interpretation of, that, of all that, okay? True prophecy comes from the heart of God. And so therefore, I don't, like, there's no fear here. And I, so I just say fear off you, Okay? And some of you might need to return the five gallons of rice that you bought, okay? We good? So fear off you. This is, we are not a church where we'll mark it off of fear, nor do I want you being ripped off because of fear propaganda in our, in our prophetic stream. Is that good? Yep, so Jesus loves you. Let's heal the sick. Let's raise the dead. Let's cast out devils. Let's make disciples of cities and nations. We've got a lot of work to do. Is that good? And I'll see you here next Sunday. And I can assure you this, the rapture ain't going to happen this week. Because we got, we got some more disciples to make. Is that good? All right, get up to your feet. If our ministry team can come, I want to bless you. Lift up your hands real high. Just declare, Father, I surrender my business, my family, my livelihood, my farm, my bank accounts, my mortgage. No compartments. I believe you want to bless me. I believe you have a plan for my life. I believe I'm a priest and a king. <laughs> Called by God for such a time as this. I will not be ruled by fear. I'll be ruled by courage coming from the heart of God. All right, declare this with me. I believe in the plans that God has for me. Plans to prosper me. Plans to bless me. Plans to give me a future and a hope. You have a future. You have a hope. You believe that this morning? Come on, let's make some happy noise.